Carefully observe the ebb and flow of defiling influences in your mind. Don't let them deceive you so readily. When you're skilled enough to catch their movements, you can transform their negative power into positive spiritual energy. Simply fetching water. Meiji Gao's bold move created a stir of excitement in Ban Hui Sai's close-knit community. Interested parties on both sides of the family voiced strong opinions. Being local women themselves, the nuns at Wat Nong Nong could not avoid becoming caught up in the ongoing drama. They supported Meiji Gao in her decision. Most of them had even encouraged it. But the situation attracted unwanted attention to their community, which led to the involvement of village affairs in monastic life. This unwelcome intrusion was further exacerbated by the close proximity of the monastery to the village. A reasonable solution was therefore urgently needed to protect spiritual harmony from being disrupted by mundane village concerns. Changing locations started to become a serious possibility as the nuns considered ways to distance themselves. Mechi Dang was convinced that the religious community, for the sake of its long-term well-being, must move far enough away that the village affairs could no longer impinge daily upon its tranquil environment. Ajahn Kampan, the abbot of Wat Nong Nong Monastery, was a long-time disciple of Ajahn Zhao Gantasilo, and a Tutanga monk well respected for his strict discipline and proficiency in meditation. As abbot of the monastery and spiritual guide to his disciples, Ajahn Kampan assumed responsibility for the community's welfare. Because the monks were also adversely affected by local events, Mei Chi Dang and Mei Chi Ying discussed the matter at length with Ajahn Kampan. Ultimately, the decision would be his. After close consultation with the monks and nuns, he chose to move to a nearby mo- he chose to move to a nearby mountain range along with those who wished to accompany him and establish a new forest monastery. Pugao Mountain was located in a small range of the Pupan foothills, six miles northwest of Ban Hoi Sai. In an age of foot trails and buffalo carts, the rugged terrain made it a remote and inaccessible destination for the casual visitor. The upper ridges were covered with solid sandstone cliffs that dropped precipitously 20 or 30 feet to densely forested slopes of tall bamboos and hardwoods. The massive strata of rock that stretched along the cliff's length were tinted dark brown by the dry lichen clinging to their surface. The cliff jutted out over the slope below, forming natural recesses of long, open grottoes beneath the overhanging rock to offer protection from the harsh sun and rain. Lacking suitable dwellings at first, the monks and nuns took up residence in these bare, earthy caves, making small platforms from bamboo, raised on stout legs several feet above the damp ground. There they lived and meditated, each in a separate location. Having no toilets, they relieved themselves on the edge of the cliffs, with an audience of amused monkeys watching from the trees. Water was a fundamental necessity and a major concern. The closest reliable supply lay a half-hour's walk from the caves in a stream that tumbled through a shallow depression between two ridges. It was decided, by mutual consent, that the junior nuns would be given the task of fetching water for the whole community, while the monks worked with local farmers to build the basic structures needed to lay the foundation for a new monastery. Each day after the meal, Meiji Gao helped the other nuns perform their water duties. She picked up two empty buckets hung them from a long, straight bamboo pole, and started to walk, descending a steep, narrow path intersected by tree roots and protruding stones, until she reached the stream. She knelt on the bank and watched as the buckets filled with fresh, cool water. Fixing one full bucket to each end of the pole, she centered the load on one shoulder and climbed back up the trail, over roots and around boulders, taking care not to spill her precious cargo. She reached the cave, tired and out of breath, yet prepared for more trips. After emptying the buckets, she returned to the stream for another load, and then again for another. Fetching water was a tedious job. It called for the same routine each day, trudging down, then up, down, then up. Every day, Meiji Gao followed the routine, and her resolve never wavered. Determined to convert mundane adversity into spiritual virtue, she meditated on Butto as she walked, silently intoning Bud with one step, To with the next. As her heart calmed, the buckets felt lighter and the work more effortless. 
Once her heart had opened, carrying water became a simple task, nothing more or less than what she was doing here and now, in the present, one mindful step at a time. Occasionally, Mechi Gao's brothers came to visit her at Pu Gao Mountain. They were shocked and dismayed to see her living conditions and the hardship she endured. They loved their sister and wanted to show solidarity with her cause. So they helped the nuns fetch water from the stream, hauling it up the mountain two heavy bucketfuls at a time. But no amount of collected water was enough to satisfy the needs of six monks and five nuns. In the end, tired and dispirited, her brothers tried to persuade her to return with them to Ban Huesai, where they could properly look after her needs. They assured her that her husband had remarried, sold their house, and moved with Gao and his new family to a distant province. But Meiji Gao was steadfast in her determination to remain with the Jan Kampan and pursue an austere, meditative lifestyle on Pu Gao Mountain. As time went on, and the mountain monastery began to take shape, water shortage became an obstacle that seemed to threaten its long-term survival. All attempts to discover a nearby source had failed. One evening, out of desperation, Mechi Gao sat down, crossed her legs, straightened her back, and focused inward. She made the solemn resolve that if she and the others were destined to stay at Pu Gao Mountain, she would discover a convenient source. She then practiced her meditation as usual. Later that night, as her mind withdrew from deep samadhi, a vision spontaneously surfaced of eleven pools of water, overgrown with vines and tall grasses. She recognized the mountainous terrain, for she had walked past the area several times, and it was only a short distance from the main cave. At Meiji Gao's urging, the nuns searched the area the following day. As Meiji Gao indicated, they found many pools of water beneath the thick vegetation. Delighted, Ajan Kampan had the nuns and local villagers cut back the vines and grasses and dig sediment out of the pools, some of which were twenty feet deep. When the work was complete, they found enough fresh water to supply the needs of the monks and nuns all year round. <laughs>